So I've seen a lot of developers not knowing how to structure their APIs. So I wanted to make this video to clear some doubts. And in fact, this is a common issue. And I've seen many YouTubers, blog posts, and other resources trying to set hard and fast rules for how you should organize your code, modules, and folders, and whatnot. You know, the thing is, a lot of these guidelines you see online are mostly aimed at front-end developers or written by front-end developers who do not really have much experience with back and technologies. I'm talking about the battle-tested frameworks like Spring Boot or C Sharp with .NET, which have been around for decades. And this is especially true with frameworks like Next.js, which make it easy to set up a backend. They are great for getting started, but they lack uniformity and structure. So what I'm going to show you isn't necessarily the correct way to do it. The best approach is the one that works for you and your team. I'm just going to offer some advice, some guidance, some things you could try to improve to make your projects more maintainable. In this example, I'll be using TRPC, which in my opinion, if you're creating a full stack application with Next.js, it is pretty much a must, but these principles apply to any backend, regardless of the language or framework. So what I like to do is keep a server directory. So this is where all of the server logic will reside. And this is important because if you're using Next.js, there might come a day where you want to refactor to another framework. Perhaps you even want to extract your server side logic to its own separate server, and you may even want to change to view, Angular, or whatever. So it's important to not tightly couple all of your logic with the framework you're using. It should be pretty agnostic. So if tomorrow you need to refactor it and move it over to an express server, this will be extremely easy. And the reason I'm saying this is because while well, Next.js isn't a backend framework, it's a full stack framework. I wouldn't be saying this if you were using a dedicated backend framework like Adonis or Nest or Bono or Elisha. This applies to your Next.js backends. And in fact, that's why I would recommend CRPC for Next.js, because CRPC is this great solution for that end-to-end -end type safety between the backend and the client. And in fact, right now, you could literally copy this directory from this demo project, paste it in an Express server, and just bind the CRPC with that server, and that's it. You didn't have to do anything whatsoever. So that's why I don't really use server actions and mutations. Sure, they are great. They could be a replacement for TRPC in some areas, although TRPC is obviously way more powerful, but it binds your logic way too much with Next.js. Sure, you could extract all of the logic to their own functions, but the moment you want to refactor this to another framework, what are you going to do? You need to still rewrite everything. You cannot keep that logic totally agnostic. So for example, here with forms, where you can say action and then you pass in this create invoice function. Sure, it looks great, but the use case for these actions are so but so limited that you shouldn't really be using them much. For example, all of the validation should be done both in the client and the backend. You know it is extremely tedious to fill out a form with 20 fields, and then when you submit, it is going to send a request to the server, so now you're wasting computation power, your server now becomes more expensive, and not only that, your server responds with a bad request. You have an error in the amount field, it should be an number. So now you display that error to the client and now the user needs to adjust that and then send it again. So you add a lot of network latency. You're heating up your server for no reason whatsoever. If it's for signing up for a newsletter, sure, use the actions. They're very easy to integrate for that purpose. But for any form, please have the validation in the client and it should be in fact on unchange. So as the user types out, validate the form so they get that instant feedback and the user experience will be great. And the great benefit, you're not hitting your server for that. So please do not rely too much on actions. So let me actually show you a real example. So we have this option right here to invite a member to a group. So if I come here, we can type out an email. Now, in fact, you could use a form action for this because, well, this is an input and you would have the submit button. So let's say we want to invite someone. So we type out the email, but the user is typing out an erroneous email. So just add G. Now we can also add the attribute to the input element to say, hey, this must be an email. So when you do this and click on invite, well, you get this right here, which comes from the browser natively, but that still isn't enough. So we could say, okay, just add A. And if we click invite, you would be making a request to your server. You would most likely have a SOD schema and well, it is going to 
respond with a bad request in valid email. What's the purpose of this? Why are you delegating this to the backend? Both the frontend and the backend should have the same validation rules. Because again, if they do not have the same validation rules, that will result in a degraded user experience. But in my case, since I'm not using actions, I just have the same SOT schema for my backend and for my frontend, and they share the same one. So if something goes wrong in the frontend, we will never hit the backend at all. Now, don't get me wrong, you can of course hook up form actions with your SOT schemas and validate everything in the front end, but that's not the point. The point is, I've come across many blog posts suggesting you to validate everything in the form action and return the errors, so then you can show the errors in the client. That's not the way to do it. If you're going to use form actions, at the very least, please share the same schema with the client, so everything runs in the client, and once everything is good to go, it is going to send that request to the server. This is just to clear up a bad practice I've been seeing a lot lately. And the mental model I've been adopting is that the server, like Next.js, lives there to hydrate your client. But any subsequent interaction, so anything that pertains to the client, will just be executed in the client. And this is in fact what you will see with anything. If you're a Rust backend developer, if you're a Go developer, a Ruby developer, it's very common to have a React or a Vue frontend and you just communicate via REST. And that's extremely scalable. Level. There's really no reason to make everything a server component. Server components, in my opinion, are there to hydrate the client, nothing more. And let's be honest, if you're using server components for everything, your application isn't really an application. It's a static website that needs to get some data from a headless CMS or whatever and display it to the user. But the moment you want interactivity, you will always need a lot of client components. And after all, that's what React solves. Anyway, let's now dive into the structure. So how do I structure my API? So it's easy to maintain and it's also easy to onboard a new member. Well, for that, I told you we have everything on their server. Then we have the API directory. So on their server, I have all of these files. So I have the database client. So I'm using Kisily, a great query builder that is very, but very type safe. Highly recommend. It's basically writing raw SQL with minimal performance hit, but with the best type safety out there, better than and something like Next, for example. And then I have Firebase, so this is for the authentication, and then the Redis client. So nothing crazy. Again, this is all just a proof of concept anyway. Then under API, I have a common directory. So here I have enums. So for example, Postgres error enum, where we have all of the potential database errors the Postgres client may throw, for example, for unique constraint violations, protocol violation, whatever. Then I also have time in seconds. And here you might have other enums. Then we have the middlewares. So here I have the global middlewares that all routers will share. So in this case, I only have this rate limit middleware. So this is simply going to use Redis and it is going to give us access to that fine grained rate limit controls. Then we have utils. So here I just have a cookie management file. So this is so that I can easily create secure cookies and delete cookies and whatnot. So again, cookie management. Then I have the logger. So, well, this is just a basic class. We have these static methods for the case where we cannot instantiate the logger client, but we also have these ones so that we can say new, so we can say new logger, and then we can pass in a name. So we can say the context will be users router, for example. And then we can say dot, and then the bug, error, info, log. And these are obviously set up for a production environment, so we do not accidentally log a debug in production. And this is what it looks like. So here I'm logging, for example, my queries. So this comes from Kisily, and this is the underlying SQL query it is executing against the database. And so we can pass in the context, I pass in how long it took and I also pass in at what time this ran or this was logged. And then I just have this file for pretty colors so I can support all of these different colors. So I have the green color in the terminal, the yellow one, the orange one, red for errors, etc. And this is in fact from a library that is named PC as well. But I had to bring the source code so I could have some custom behavior that the library natively didn't support. Now, aside from this, since I'm using TRPC, then I have this root file. So this is where all of the routers will be defined. So here we have the auth router, the groups router, group invites, and then the users router. And then I have the TRPC file. So this contains the procedure, the context and whatnot. So again, you can find the repository in the description. And then I have the routers. 
So under this directory, so I have the auth router, here I have the base module. So here is the controller, here is where I define the endpoints. So we have the login endpoint, the me endpoint, and then we have the logout endpoint. And again, this is just for the controller. So here I handle the rate limiting options. And I also handle the input, the output, and all I do is call a method from the auth service. So every router has a service, which is where the actual logic lives. And then I have the auth types. So here I define the return types from the endpoints. So as we can see, we have the me query result. And well, it is defined in this file. That way, my client can also consume this type if it needs it, maybe for caching validation or passing the data as props to another component, well, whatever it is. And then I have the service, which lives within its own directory so that we can collocate the types for the service. So I embrace collocation a lot. So everything lives together where it should be. You might see people defining these services at the top level of this directory and everything becomes a mess because nothing is collocated. So I like to keep things together. So on the Roth, again, I have the service directory and then I have the auth service file. So here I have all of the logic for the auth service. I'm using classes for this. The reason is because I like to have these private methods and everything is within this entity. So I just say private, the caller cannot access this method. Well, I believe it can, but TypeScript will not let you. And then we can say the access modifiers to public. And then I can just say this, that, and reshare the same functions. But of course, you do not need to use a class. You can use an object and pass in the methods directly there. This is just for that developer experience, nothing more. I will not be using inheritance or anything like that. I'm just using classes for the organization. That's it. And then once I have defined all of the methods, then I can say export const auth service and I instantiate this service. That way in the router, I just say auth service dot login. And as for the types for the auth service, here I defined everything pertaining to well the service to the logic of the authentication module. So I have the arguments defined here for these methods. So for example, add user session args, which I'm using for this method right here, add user session. So it provides a great separation of concerns without polluting your code. But since everything is collocated, then it is very easy to find what belongs to what and where that lives. But the auth module, so the auth router is quite basic. Let's come here too the groups router. So here I have more directories. I have the groups input. So here I define the sort schemas, which my router will consume and the client will consume. So I can just import the sort schemas from this file. And I also have the types again to synchronize the types from the router. So I can say this returns a promise of create group mutation result, which is this one, but my client can consume it as well. And then here again, this is the controller. So all I do is call the service, define the rate limiters and any other middlewares you might have and define the input. That's it. Nothing more. So I have create group, delete group, undo delete group, get all groups. And then I have the invites, which is a nested router. And in fact, with CRPC, you can pass in routers as if they were procedures, which are going to get nested with the base router. So here we have the groups router and then the invites, which points to the group invites router, which contains all of these procedures. So send group invite, accept group invite, decline, remove, etc. So everything is collocated. And why? Because, well, you're in sub routers, the group invites pertain to groups. And in fact, you could have all of this logic right here, all of these group invites logic within the service of groups. But that would be terrible because, well, you're not providing a separation of concerns. And now this file could be potentially a thousand lines long. So I like to extract everything to something where the modules are shared. So in this case, everything pertaining to group invites will live under the group invites module. That's it. And well, everything that pertains to groups themselves lives under this parent module. So this one right here, and this provides the great benefit of being able to collocate everything. And then I also have the repository files. So I have the groups.repository where here we interact with the database. So this is the data access layer. This is known as the repository pattern. I have a whole video dedicated on that, but in short, you simply create a repository where it has all all of the methods that you can access to communicate with your database. So you can provide that extra separation of concerns. And that's a huge mistake I've seen many developers do is they interact with the database like this, whether that's using Prisma, Drizzle, Kisily, or even just RawSQL within the service or worse within the controller. So here in the router, 
where they have all of the logic within each endpoint. That can become a huge mess in no time. So that's why you should use the service and repository layers. That way the service is where you do the actual logic. So here we validate the input. So we hit up a database, make sure that the group exists. Then we check if the member exists. This is for sending a group invite. And then we get the expiration time. And then we add the pending invite. But notice how we're not writing the SQL here, but rather we're communicating with the repository. So here we can encapsulate the data access logic. And we can also do extra validation here, throw errors here and there. And again, great separation of concerns, easy to work with. If you need to add something, modify something, it's just as easy as coming here, adding a new method, and then you can reuse this logic anywhere. And to show you where this really shines is within the user's repository. So here I have the user repository where I have this get user by ID. So here in this get user by ID, we can pass in the ID of the user we want to retrieve. And then we say this dot get cached user info. And this is being cached in Redis. So we do not hit up the database every single time. But by doing this, that means that if you create a user, what happens if now the cache gets out of sync with the new user or with the updated user? Well, whenever you call get user by ID, you're going to get a stale data, meaning data that is no longer valid and it is behind the actual existing data. So for this, since I'm using the repository pattern, this is very easy to contain. So here where we have the absurd user, for example, whenever we absurd a user, so create a user or update a user, then we just say this dot cache user info, which is going to communicate with Redis and set the user information. So we can easily synchronize everything. Imagine if we weren't using the repository pattern, what would you do? Would you just copy and paste this logic every single time you updated a user? You might do that, but I wouldn't recommend that. Again, separation of concerns. This is all encapsulated. This logic is never exposed to the consumer. Now under groups, aside from these two, so repository and service, I also have a cron folder. And this is for the cron jobs. So for example, I want to delete expired groups. Well, I create this file with the cron job. And here I just say delete from groups. Then using the sub query, we get all of the groups where the leader ad is less than now, minus seven days. And we limit this to 5,000 and then we perform the delete. So this is for removing the soft deleted rows. So again, everything is self-contained within the groups module. And if here I need to use something maybe from the repository from the groups, I can just bring over the groups repository and invoke that method here and call it a day. So that's why I like to be very organized so that if in a year I need to come back to this project and do something, I know where everything lives, everything is encapsulated, and it is a breeze to work with. Now you might be wondering, okay, this is great, but is this all for the client? I mean, we're using TRPC, so how are you expecting us to be able to use this in server components? And well, in fact, you can use TRPC in server components, which can be basically the same as those functions that you create and mark as server only. So here, if I come to the TRPC directory, I have these two clients. So I have the React client. So this one creates a query client from Tanstack query. We have some default configuration here and we have the TRPC client and then we have the HTTP batch link again because well this will be via HTTP and then we have the link so the logger link for logging and then we have the transformer and then we wrap up our application with the query client provider from Tanstack query and then the API provider from TRPC. But as for the server, because well, you cannot use this in the server component, we create this one right here. So create TRPC proxy client, we pass in the logger link for logging. And then here we have this custom RSC link that lets us invoke procedures without using HTTP requests. Since server components always run on the server, we can just call the procedure as a function. So this is great because we can pass in the same context. We can pass in the procedures, the path, the raw input, everything. And we achieve the same behavior basically, except for obviously the use query and use mutation helpers. But what we can do is for example, we have in the layout, the hydration for the user information. So we can say a sync function, get me, this returns the me query result. So again, this comes from the auth types, and then we just return await API.auth.get 
Me, dot Query. And this will invoke the procedure as a function, as you would do by just creating a separate function like this. So you're not doing any HTTP request. That way we can say const user is equal to await get me. So we mark this layout. So the server component asynchronous, and then we can perform this. We use unstable no store to avoid caching the user information per session. That would be terrible. And then we render everything else. So we render the user initializer, and this will just initialize the store from the data that it gets from the server component, which in this case is the layout. So we check if it has been initialized. This is when we go back and forth from different pages. We avoid resetting or setting from scratch every single time the user session in the SOD store. So I just say use session store dot set state, and then I pass in the data. And then the status would be authenticated if the server component did in fact return a user or well, this is going to throw an error if there is no user. So this will be null. Hence, this will be unauthenticated. That way we can hydrate or initialize the data from the server component. That way we avoid from the client performing our request to that endpoint, optimizing a little bit this logic. And then, well, we can just use this store from a client component as you would do traditionally, whether that's with the Next.js Pages router or vanilla with Vit. So this now wraps up the video. Again, you can find the repository in the description, so make sure to check it out. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to like the video and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. See ya.